You know, people who are listening to this podcast can't see that. That's why they should watch it on YouTube. No, it's a podcast. You're not supposed to watch it on YouTube. You can if you want to. No, that's true. And you can watch it on, that's right, Patreon. Actually, you won't be able to watch this one on Patreon. Oh, none of it? Well, you'll be able to watch the second half on Patreon. Yeah. But, uh, no, first half is free for the viewing on our YouTube channel, as always. That's true. That was my clever way of saying, we have a Patreon. Yeah, I know. I wasn't going to say anything, but now you've ruined the entire subtlety of your plan. I'm not a subtle person, but this is, this is very true. Uh, go check it out. I think that the video we made got shadow banned by YouTube because we were talking about Patreon. Something like oh, that. Oh, our, pa our Patreon introduction video, video yeah. was, yes. It was not well received. Or um, it was partially ignored by the people. Yeah. <laughs> that is an option. That's fair. <laughs> it's option number two. But yeah, we have a Patreon. Go check it out. We Sound do. Low. We do. Um, and just just in this particular case, before we get into this, into, into today's podcast episode, podcast number 11. Mm hmm before we jump into it, I would like to acknowledge one of our Patreon. Basically, I think he was our first, the first of our Patreon subscribers. Yeah. And that would be Ant. Ant. Uh, Ant is, um, he's actually a longtime supporter of the Old War. Like, he was supporting us way back on, um, uh, when we were on coffee, when we were trying to yep. you know, have coffee as being the membership platform. Yep. And he had a timely donation to us that allowed us to buy some extra um, um, cards, SD cards. Yes, uh, came in, came in at just the right time. And he has yeah. he has he actually went and found the Patreon channel before we even announced it yeah, was out there, it was, which was really cool. Um, yeah, he's so. he's a really good guy. We communicate with him pretty regularly. Um, so thank you, Ant. We appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for for helping us out here on Patreon. Anyway, anyway, moving on. Okay. We have a lot to cover in this particular podcast. Yes, because. I had some really cool stuff happen. And so a large part of this is going to be a little different from our normal podcast. You know, we're not, we usually do treasure and magic items and things like that. We're going to do it. I would like to correct me if you don't want to, but I would like to dedicate probably most of this podcast to the second edition of Fantasy World Magazine. Yes. Uh, for those of you who might remember who've been around uh, the, the old warlock for a while we did a video when was it maybe eight months ago nine months ago mm, probably around a year ago a year ago uh, of, of a fan of a fanzine a mm. D&D fanzine that came out in the 1980s called fantasy world magazine we'll put the link to the video yeah somewhere it, it'll be down in the in the yeah. description of this video for those of you who are watching this or listening to this on um, a podcast of a podcast station-ish thing, you know, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatever. You'll just have to find it yourselves, unfortunately. You can go to, I think that they should be able to just search Fantasy World Magazine. Yeah. Um, the Old Warlock, and it'll probably... And it'll pull pop the, up. The There's only one really talking about it, so... But um, I really love the magazine. When we managed to get a hold of that first copy, it was a handwritten, what was it, 130 pages long? Something or like something. That. It was huge. And it was put out by a guy by the name of Rob and his wife Candy mm -hmm. in uh, Batesville, Indiana. And I loved the thing because it was, uh, there was such a focus on community world building. I mean, if you want to talk yeah. about, if you, if you really want to get into a, a combined storytelling, Mm -hmm. He, Rob, who the person who was the publisher of Fantasy World Magazine, yeah. he really raised that to another level because what he what he started to try and do in the in the course of that magazine mm -hmm. was create a world that was that had contributions to it by a number of different people. So he gave out franchises to, and that's how he described them. He, he gave yeah. out franchises to different sections of this world of Manset that he wanted to put together mm -hmm. so that individuals could actually build components of the world that he was threading together, which yeah. I thought was really, really cool. Yeah. Anyway, um, for more details on that, go look at that the Fantasy World magazine yeah, video. Yeah, we talked about we it all in depth back there. But at the end of that video, we put out a call for anybody who might have been a franchise holder in the world of Manset to get in touch with us, as we often do with these fan created things. Yeah, because we love to. We, I, I am, I really look forward to hearing from people who are involved in these projects back in the day because, mm -hmm. you know, this was my time and. 
you guys, there, there are people out there who are doing some wonderful, fascinating, fun things that I never got to do at the time. So I'm, I want to live vicariously through these people's experiences. Yeah. Anyway, we put out the call, and lo and behold, somebody who held a franchise in the world of Manset got in touch with us. Why? Guy, guy by the name of Eric Johnson, and he's been really cool. Um, he he got in touch with us and said, "Yeah, I was one of the franchise holders." He ended up getting me a copy of the second edition yes. of world of, uh, of of fantasy world magazine of the two editions of the, that there were of the t- so i've got i'm a hundred percent holder now yeah. in, in yeah. fantasy world magazine but he sent that he sent a lot of things that he had written he, he ended up being a an actual a, really a, a good uh, a really good author of oh, yeah. fantasy science fiction mm-hmm. uh articles and things mm-hmm. and I, i'm talking fiction yeah uh, they were they were a lot of fun to read, but um, he also pointed out all of the things, all, all of the, the contributions that he made to the world of Manset. Now I've tried to get in touch with Rob, the publisher of Fantasy World Magazine. I have, have not had any success. No. I have one last address. I'm actually going to type up a regular letter. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to actually type up a letter and send it through the mail. You guys are gonna have a heyday with that one, I know. Um, yeah, because all the people who are watching us are like, yeah, we know what it is, yeah, Bob. you <laughs> stupid young guy. So I'm going to actually send it, because he may, there is a chance that he still um, is at an address that I have for him, and I'm, I'm going to see if that happens. But regardless, shot. Yeah. regardless, I managed to get a hold of this, this uh, second edition of Fantasy World Magazine mm-hmm. because of the graciousness of uh, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Really and so we are going to go over... Edition 2 of Fantasy World Magazine, because I think there are some things to talk about in here that you might find interesting. Let's get started. Let's do this. So, Fantasy World Magazine, number two. Um, I'm going to have to scroll through some things here. I've got this in a PDF, and I have highlighted the things to talk about. But again, let's, let's start off by looking at... Jim said, scrolling madly through, because we're trying to get through more things in our podcast now. Yeah. There are 112 pages of D&D goodness in this. Um, the first edition, I, th- I want to say it had 130, but in this one, it's only it's only 112. I mean, yeah. Come on, Rob. You're falling down on the job here. Only 112 pages? This one is not hand drawn or handwritten. It is done in some sort of a word processor typewritery thing. But it does not detract from how cool this actually is. No, but I do respect immensely your effort put into the first one where you wrote the entire oh, thing. Oh yeah, I, I, mean, I, I don't. Ha- I've never in my life had that kind of patience to write 130 some pages. I still get my D's and B's mixed up when I write. Like it's yeah. Really? No. Okay. Uh, this was published in 1984, and this is Role Players Workshop that that put um, Fantasy World Magazine out. Mm-hmm. I wish that I could actually go through the entire contents of this magazine with you. Uh, if I ever get the chance to talk to Rob, the publisher of this, I'm going to ask him if he will give me permission to put these PDFs someplace where you can download them and read them for yourselves. But I, you know, for copyright reasons, I can't yeah. throw all this up. There, uh, okay. Well, we'll just gonna, we're just going to kind of go through here very quickly until I get to one of the interesting, one of the more interesting parts. There's an there's an extra bit of fiction in this, and so it seems as though. Um, Rob had some success in getting people to make contributions. He was actually paying mm. people, I want to say it was $2.50 a page. Yeah, something like that for anything that they sent. Well, for, for any fiction that, yeah. that was yeah, written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it was like D&D module related, it was $5 a page. Mm. I would have been all over this in 1984. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, a couple, a couple of interesting things here. There's, And we'll look at some of the... A lot of the... Okay, there's some individual fiction just of stories of a guy or a girl doing whatever okay mm-hmm. you know just just you know fantasy science fictiony stories but there's also a lot of fiction in here that is directly related to the world of manset so some of these are from the individual franchise holders talking about the section of manset that they controlled so yeah. they're giving political background they're mm-hmm. giving uh the background of of, of particular characters mm-hmm. uh they um, eric the person who sent this did a write-up of a king of dwarves and also the weapon that this this lineage of dwarves had mm-hmm. uh, and also he had a he even had a um, um, a genealogy 
tree for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for these for the kings yeah. of this dwarven this dwarven area. But let's uh, there just to kind of give a little bit of context. I want to just read one or two things of some of the gamer profiles because those are those are very important uh, in these magazines because it, Rob seems to have really been trying to establish a sense of community. Yeah, and so he actually talks about the people who are making contributions. So this is a gamer profile of DG Geiser. Uh, DG is a founder of the Batesville Fantasy Guild uh, and a member of its governing body, the Square Table. Uh, his favorite player character is the halfling thief Shrock. Goes on and on. Uh, DG loves metal bands. He hates Wave, um, Michael Jackson, Smurfs, and the Pillsbury Doughboy. Uh, I can understand all of those. Even level. even even today, yeah. Yeah. Um, DG is a junior at Batesville High School. After graduation, he wants to study communications and get rich. He's thinking about Good advertising call. or the radio film TV field. The idea that he hopes will make him a millionaire is the Trip Theater, which would evidently provide its patrons with bizarre experiences so people don't have to do drugs, but they can still freak out. I mean... If that isn't the most... That's like the early 80s, 80s in thing. one sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, then it goes on to, and I, it, what, I, what I seem to think is happening here is these franchise holders are creating the content, but Rob is doing the map for the mm -hmm. entire world, mm -hmm. including the areas of the franchise holders, so that um, there's, a, there's a cohesiveness, there's yeah. a consistency all the way across this world that he, is, that he is creating. There's still some form of control over the whole thing. Right. Um, now, whether or not it's driven, I, I, I want to believe that the maps are driven by the franchise holders, not the other way around. I don't think that yeah. Rob was asking people to, here's a map with all these things on it, you develop the story behind mm -hmm. what I've done. It seems to be going the other way, but I could be wrong on that. But either way, it's, it's cool. good that there's community aspect to it. Exactly. There are loads of these fantastic maps, and I, I'm going to throw, you know, copyright notwithstanding, I'm going to throw some of these maps up on the, on the screen in the, in the video version of this particular podcast, because... They're all hand drawn and they are fantastic. But okay, so let's get some examples of the content that some of the franchise holders are throwing in here. Um, this one is for okay. This is called the Great Men of Quelan. Q U E L A N. The report of Raja, sage of Asplacht, to Rachel. Uh, Warlord of Quelan, 1498 TA, by Donald L. Davis. So I'm assuming that Donald L. Davis is the franchise holder, but he's he's packaging his franchise information in the form of a letter written to uh, from one person to who is exploring this region mm -hmm. to the leader of the region. Okay. That's that's okay. the feeling that I'm getting. Uh, starts out, I, Raja, Sage of Asplacht, was surprised to see the Warlord's army come to my abode on the outskirts of town. I was even more surprised when they delivered me to a, delivered to me an invitation to come as an honored guest to the Warlord's castle for a banquet. Um, so it goes on from there about how he just ended up talking. He had to make a couple days travel, and then he ended up meeting with this Warlord to tell the Warlord about his experiences. Mm -hmm. Um I'll go and read a little section here. Uh, this is about, he, he talks about Derek the Ancient Druid. This is part of his report to the Warlord. Uh, Derek the Ancient Druid. My next story is about a friendly and very powerful man turned cold and bitter when the person he loved most was taken from him. Goes on and on. Um, Derek, again, this is the Ancient Druid, as he was known, was born in the now ruined city of Chavalon. So he, all of these, this is great. And this is written by, um, I want to say that this writer was either a sophomore or a junior in high school yeah, yeah, when this yeah. was all being put together. Mm -hmm. um, Which is impressive. It, it is. He was the son of Shemal, druid leader of the people of Shavalon and protector of the quaking forest. He was brought up to follow in his father's footsteps and to one day take over leadership of Shavalon and the quaking forest. Um, blah, blah, blah. But these are the, just. this is just to give you kind of an idea of the details that these people were creating and fleshing out this world. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who were DMing or playing in D&D at that time, this would have been a really cool opportunity for them because for the most part, you were doing a lot of modules. You know, you, you, yeah, in, terms yeah, of the, yeah. in terms of creating really cool content for yourself, mm -hmm. Rob created, through his efforts with Fantasy World Magazine, he created a mechanism for people to be able to explore their own creativity, but he kind of like gave the spark for them to get started yeah, on these yeah, things. Yeah. 
But this goes on, um, this whole report called The Great Men of Quailin, this bad boy goes on one, two, three, four, um, five. This goes on for five typewritten pages. It's pretty impressive. When That's I was fine. in high school, I didn't do that kind of information for you know reports and classes. Oh, five, no. five typewritten pages? No. No, absolutely not. If I had had the opportunity to type up five typewritten pages for a D and D scenario, oh, uh, absolutely, would have been all over That's it. That's a whole different thing. That's you fun. Um, so anyway, there's another one. The, the next one is called "Life Among the Barbarians of the South," as told by Hegelic of Quaylen, and this is again Donald L. Davis. Um, he goes on to talk about how this is the experiences of this guy who's been who's who's from Quaylen. Uh, this town of Quaylen, or the city of Quaylen, and he finally gets to return to Quaylen after 18 years. Uh, skipping a bit into it, at last I reach the gates. Oh, the smells, the people, the city, I love them all. This truly is my home. Listen to the voices speaking my tongue, not some idiotish tribal tongue, but mine. What should I do first? Meet with the warlord as my teacher would have wanted? Nay, firstly, I must enjoy the wonders of the city, my home. I must take a bath. Um, not in a freezing sea, but in a hot tub. I won't go on to the next part. Um, but anyway, because we have a G-rated uh, thing here. But so uh, these were PG. You know, the uh, World of Manset was a PG, but I'm not going to go any further. But it gives you an idea of the different yeah. types of writing and, and the cool, different, creative ways that people were imparting the information that they had in their heads into the World of Manset and yeah. for the reader. Um, just really, to me, this would have stood out um, head and shoulders above anything that I did in English class in high school. Yeah. This was a much better experience writing about something I was interested in mm -hmm. um, and having to express myself for an audience as opposed to just one teacher. Well, yeah. This is really, this is a great exercise in English, and that's something that we've always discussed. Uh, at least the friends that I play with, mm -hmm. that I've played this game with for coming up on 50 years. Well, um, <laughs> One of the things we've always discussed is the huge educational value there is to playing role-playing games. And I yeah. think that that's really highlighted here. Um, you know, map reading skills, writing skills, communication skills. Um, it's all tied into this these role-playing games that we all love to play. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really borne out here. Um, it's crystallized here in the writings of things that people have submitted to things like uh, fantasy world magazine well yeah and even just interpersonal skills like that's something that exactly. can help build especially for people who might not have a lot of you know interpersonal relationships outside of this the right. game allows the development of those but um i think that this like you're kind of saying this it gives people an audience to yes. if, if you know that somebody is going to be reading what you write you're more inclined to try and do a good job do something to the best of your ability or if you're just writing your world for yourself which i completely support and i think that people should because that's yes. a lot of fun anyway and that's also important but if you know that there's going to be some sort of significance that's going to be published people are going to see it then you you know you push yourself that much more and you develop your skills that much more not only as a D, &D player and a role-playing gamer ro yeah that, that works yeah but role-playing game gamer yeah but as a writer as well right and I, you know and again i hate to you know i don't want to beat the dead horse but you know if you're writing for your teacher who you will never see after the current semester of junior high or high school as opposed to people who are your peers who you will be seeing at the next bat con in mm -hmm. batesville indiana you know again that that's all something that pushes you to do better and if you're right again if you're writing about something you enjoy that's going to make you do more, um, put more effort into it as well. Now, we are not saying that school is unimportant. No, 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 not at all. Trying hard is unimportant. Not at all. But I, I'm not, and I'm one of those people that believes that um, school teachers should be paid more. Um, I think that, you know, it's a very difficult thing for a teacher to teach nowadays. It was difficult mm -hmm. back in the day. But I think that. This is an application if, of the skills you get in school outside of a school environment. And that's what's important. Right, but I think at the same time, I think that if schools would allow these kinds of things mm. for um, English grades, yeah, I think that that would be a good thing. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'll throw in one more thing here from Hygelic's report. 
Uh, at the moment, the barbarians pose no threat, but if we choose to ignore them now, we will only welcome an attack with a, from a powerful people in the future. We saw the havoc wrought by a smaller force during the first barbarian expansion. Now, with a larger force, the barbarians are sure to accomplish their goals of territorial expansion and rulership. I like that. That's cool. I like having a historical aspect to the world, the things that have happened in the past, and that dictates the decisions that people make now. I and think that's cool. And we'll get more into that later on as I go through this, because there's, there's a little bit more along those lines. Mm -mm. Oh, the next one is let's talk about Fang Deep. This is another franchise that is held by Scott Moore. Scott. Um, I'm just going to jump into here real quickly. He's doing his description. Let me tell you a little about Fang Deep. Situated in a huge valley with the Caron Mountains to the west, the Grey Mountains to the south and southeast, and the Cloudbiter Mountains to the east, Fang Deep is fairly isolated from the rest of the world. It is also largely uncivilized because it was only discovered by Marnock 188 years ago. He goes on for a couple of pages about all of the of the exports and the imports of Fang Deep and how they're how they're important economically fitting into the rest of the world of Mansit things like that. And I love that. It is it's great. And again, you know, he he does all this in the from the point of view of someone who lives there who is communicating information to a, a leader. Yeah. He also includes a timeline of Fang Deep history. All dates are in the third age. 1310, Marnock vo born. 1332, Ilnan, son of Mar Marnock vo born. 1349, Verdeflam, sword of the rulers of Fangdeep, forged by Marnock. So he goes through, and it's almost like a um, Lord of the Rings style thing. You, can, yeah, yeah, you get a yeah. real feel for that as you're going That's through probably, this. They probably played no small part in I bet I, Exactly. I think you're exactly right. Uh, then... There's an interesting part here from the editor of the magazine at the end of, of uh, these things from uh, that relate to Fangdeep. Uh, and it says, it's in a scroll, so it's an aside. Attention, World of Mansut franchise holder. We need stories and articles about the history of and current situation in your area of the World of Mansut, including entries for the World of Mansut timeline, see page 46, for publication in the future in future issues of Fantasy World magazine, submission requirements on page three, the editor. So this was a this is obviously intended to be an ongoing situation. Yeah, they didn't weren't planning necessarily to call it quits after this one. Um, then right after the article about Fang Deep, there's a map that is drawn by um, Rob. You can tell by the the uh, map creating style. He did a map of Fang Deep. Uh, the Kingdom of Fang, Fang Deep and the surrounding wilderness as prepared by, uh, his name is Snipe Longstride? It's a little bit of a blur on Snipe. I think it's Snipe Longstride. It looks, yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, then we go from there into uh, some fiction by Troy Ilderton. We, he was mentioned, I remember that name from the previous... Well, this is part two. Yes, it, sense. good point. This is the Beastmaster and this is just straight up fiction from Troy Ilderton. Uh, a number of pages of that, and then that that that, that um, article was meant to be continued. But then we get to one of my favorites, Coming Events, 1984. <laughs> August 25th, ShelbyCon 1 in Shelbyville, Indiana, uh, at the Civic Center, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, features an original adventure module by Rob, the Mad Magician's Tournament. Also, a super sale on dice, miniatures, and modules. Be there. Or be square. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> you, you. You would just fit. You would have fit right. They would have loved me. They would. Was, oh, it's him. Uh, um, afternoon, everybody. <laughs> so, then we have, on November 17th, BatCon 3. Uh, and um, Eric mentioned... Being at BatCon, and I think I think he said he was at BatCon two and possibly ShelbyCon because I don't think he yeah. was from Batesville. I think he I, was from Shelby. I think he said he was at BatCon one and two and ShelbyCon. He might have been at all. Okay, might yeah, have been at all three. I, I can't remember, remember but for sure. If we're wrong, sorry. We've been taking in a lot of information here in the yeah. past couple of days. Uh, anyway, November seventeenth, BatCon three at Batesville, Indiana Middle School, ten a.m. I think I'm constantly switching between Batesville, Ohio, and Batesville, Indiana. It's Indiana if I've said mm -hmm. Ohio in any of this. Um, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. features an original adventure module by Chris Strobel. Gray, Gray Dawn. Sorry, I wrote Gray. over it with my highlighter. Gray Dawn, Gaming Aid, Super Sale, Miniatures, Painting Comparison, or Competition. See, it's interesting to see that that still continues. Yeah. Then enter the above tournament adventures alone or with a team. Prizes, fun. Fun. I would have been all over this. Uh, cost $4 in advance, $7 at the door. Send inqu inquiries or payment to... 
you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's interesting to me that so many of these, because I remember from the last one, so many of these are held at middle schools and high schools. You don't see that. Doesn't happen anymore. Doesn't happen. No. I mean, which to me is really a sad commentary. Yeah. Now, I bet you could get a lot of these done at your local library. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I bet you, I bet you could. Well, but at the same time, if you've got 100 people coming in, the library might not want to handle it. That's fair. But yeah, I used to love the idea that these were held in the auditoriums of the local, of the local yeah, or junior just in, high school. In the gym, they open it up and put some tables out. I think right. that's fun. Uh, then we're following up. We have some more fiction uh, submitted by a variety of different people. A few more maps. Thank you. You're welcome. We're going to do. I, I want to do another gamer profile again. This is just to give you some kind of context. And those of you who were around in the '80s, you're going to you're going to get a visual image of this guy. Because we maybe, all we all knew these people. Maybe you are this guy. Yeah, I yeah. Some of these people, some of these component or some of these uh, characteristics of these guys. It was me. Yeah. Uh, Chris, this is Chris Strobel. Uh, Chris was a, is a sophomore at Batesville High School. He started playing fantasy role playing games while in junior high in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, goes on a bit. Uh, so I have to see. You keep doing that, and I have to look around. The how's that work? Sorry, that work that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Though Chris is a top student, he claims he doesn't study much. This leaves him with plenty of time to write fantasy fiction. Hmm, hmm that's interesting. Familiar. Yeah, like the stories in this issue of Fantasy World. His module, Grey Dawn, took first place in RPW's 1984 module design competition and will be play tested at BatCon 3 this summer. Hey, um, I have to add this in as well. Chris is involved in track as well as underground politics at school. What were you doing there, Chris? Yeah, you need mm -hmm. to let us know. Yeah. Uh, he also likes music. His favorite groups are Yes. How many of you remember Yes? No. Devo. How many of you remember Devo? And The Human League. How many of you remember those? I do. I was never a big fan of any of the three of them, but a lot of people were. What were they? Rock bands or? Um, I'm sorry. You guys are going to tear me a new one. We're, we're, we're going to we're gonna have to. We, we'll go into that in another. I'll, I'll, I'll play some You'll of play for some you. for you? Yeah. I, I don't wanna, we, we have, we're covering a lot of territory in this podcast. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll show you something. I some appreciate that. Yes, I, I did enjoy Yes. Uh, Devo and Human League, not my not my company. No. <laughs> no. Anyway. This, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I know you're glad I'm here. I'll be putting out an ad for a new co-host at some co point in the near future, so just so you know. Um, so then we move to the Kingdom of Dwarnor. And this was written by Eric Johnson, the person who submitted this to us for just because Eric. he wanted us to have them. Yeah. Uh, so this is the history of the great kings of Dwarnor from Eric Stoutheart to Eric Ironheart. Where uh, do you get the inspiration for those names? Then? I'm not sure. Interesting. The kings and people of Dwarnor have fought many wars and they will fight more if need be. Then he goes in to talk about Eric Stoutheart, who is the first true king of the Dwarven people. Uh, describes what he did to uh, help create this kingdom of the dwarves. Um, I'm not going to go through this entire thing, but he does give the DM's notes for Eric Ironheart in terms of the uh, his character's characteristics. So he has his alignment, he's got his age, he's got his height, his weight, his strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma, uh, which is great because it makes it a... Uh, if, for those of us who are really familiar with characteristics of of uh, D&D characters. This really puts it right into context. A solid character, too. Yeah, he was. Uh, then he, The thing I like about this is he does, like I was saying, he does the family tree of the kings of Dwarnor, mm -hmm. starting with Eric Stoutheart, the Deliverer, and then it moves all the way down through several generations of different characters. I mean, we're looking at how many generations there. One, two, three, four, five, six, like ten oh, generations, right. ten, twelve generations. Go back up here. Back to... Dane Longbeard the, the fourth. fourth. Mm -hmm. hmm. Dane, uh, another interesting name. Yes, it is. But we all did that. That's what. Oh that's yeah, what we no, did I've, back I've, in the I've day. done the I mean, same thing. Yeah. Um, but then he 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 goes on, Eric, buddy. Oh, good lord! You know he then goes on and he's he made dwarvish <laughs> runes. Now I don't know if he took these from Let's Norwegian go, runes or Nordic runes, but he's got runes uh, for these. And I think that that was a that was a real popular thing back in the day because you could. You could, if you tried hard enough, you yeah. could read the runes in the Lord of the Rings. Well, oh yeah, yeah. Well, here we are. We've got dwarvish runes here, which I think is fantastic. That's really cool. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the weapon of the dwarven kings, which is cool. This is called Rookledge. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, Eric. 
uh, R-U-K-L-J. The name Ruckledge, 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 or Ruckledge, Ruckledge, uh -huh. comes from the dwarven words Ruk, which means foe, and Ilge, slayer. So it's foe slayer. But he goes down um, through the history of this particular weapon and how it was created and then who ended up using it. But then he's also got the DM's notes talking about it being a plus five battle axe to hit and damage, has an intelligence of 16 and an ego of 12. Uh, Rookledge will not try to dominate the user unless he is not the current ruler of Dwarnor. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. But again, g these are just cool details that these people were, you know, these people were inspired to put together. Oh, you I like love, the proclamations? I love, I love that. So, so that's, that kind of sums up a lot of the content, the direct world of Manset con, 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 taiba. The direct <laughs> world of Manset right contributions that people were making to the magazine, or at least yeah. to this particular magazine. Then we do get to the proclamations, which has this great image of a trumpet with, uh, with proclamations banner hanging off of yeah. the after love. Uh, and then it says, earn money. Uh, we are now accepting submissions for Fantasy World number four. So apparently, Fantasy World number three, mm -hmm. they had received their submissions for it. Where is Fantasy World number three? Yeah. If it was. Um, Eric seems to think that it it never happened. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I believe him because, I mean, he was kind of yeah. right there in yeah, the mix. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder if, what happened? if there are just a scattering of notes in somebody's in a shoebox in somebody's the basement great somewhere. mystery of yeah that, that's actually really interesting i really want to find out anyway we are now accepting submissions for fantasy world number four we pay two dollars and fifty cents per magazine page five dollars per page for modules rob, um rob if you're watching you gotta get in touch with us man. we want to know <laughs> where the third one is and what happened to it well if there is a third one or where the notes are where the draft right, is or I, something I mean, here's here's my offer you provide me with the notes for it, I'll put that bad boy together mm -hmm. and I will make sure that it gets out for the people to enjoy. So, <laughs> you know, I, and, and again, the reason for that is because I believe this magazine to be one of the best I've ever seen yeah. in terms of a fanzine. Yeah. Um, then Especially a, considering it was just done by, you know, not a huge, it wasn't no, TSR or anything like no. that. It was just people who liked the game. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's really, really cool to me. Um, then there is... In Treasure Chest, this is good ideas from gamers. And Eric Johnson is back in the, in the spotlight here for something that he called the, I wrote over it, the Rook Dual Moor, which is a snake demon. And he gives the, uh, this is something that dwarves um, have to combat on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. so he made sure that this is included in here because of, he was talking so much about wow. this dwarven yeah. franchise that he had been, that he had put together. Yeah. I'm going. I'm scrolling through here for those of you who can't see what I'm doing. Then we have the. We move on to page. Geez, what page is this? 46 of the World of Manset timeline. Uh, all of this needs to be fleshed out according to Rob. Uh, but there are some information. There is some information in here that people that the franchise holders have submitted. So it's starting to build. Yeah. Then we get into a little more fan fiction, or not fan fiction, but fiction. There are. Go ahead. Eye of the Beholder. Is that that's uh, you know that's pretty cool. I never. I never. I. <laughs> oh, yeah. This guy. Yeah, yeah. D and D humor. Um, yeah. I you know that's pretty much. I'm I'm sure that's where the that's gotta be. beholder came yeah, from. Yeah. I never considered that before because I've always kind of wondered that. If you guys know any more, let me know. Uh, then there's a section on gaming aids. This is just things that they're selling that uh, that Fantasy World magazine is selling. So. They've got Roll Aids books. Uh, they've got Grenadier Dragon Lords boxed miniatures. So they seem to have purchased them at, at a discount, and then they're selling them to people here yeah. uh, because they have you know send orders too, and you can you can get some of these things. Mm -hmm. Then there is, and I you guys are going to be playing this. This is a this is a module called Mists of the White Mound W I G H T uh, by Rob. And it's a World of Manset tournament module for player teams of third level. Oh, and nice. I've had the chance, I haven't had the chance to go through this in complete detail, but... The title alone sounds very cool. There, It's it's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to just toss this bit in here. This is from the player's information sheet. And Rob was really a good, he was an excellent DM from what I can tell. 
And the information that he put into his modules, it's not too much, it's not too little, but it's very immersive. It's it's the immersive information you need to do something really yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm going to say in here, uh, I'm just going to read this one part where he gives a description of this, of what's driving this particular module. During moonless and dark nights, mists roll in from the north and lay siege to the small village. Local inhabitants have taken to barricading themselves in their homes, whispering superstitious tales about the darklings. Others tell myths about the ancient city of wonders which, uh, that is said to lie underneath the White Mounds. Now, just as an aside... Sounds a little bit familiar. It does. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying at all no. that Barrow Maze no. was linked to this. We would never insinuate that. No, and I'm not. You know, I, no, I seriously doubt if, if they... It's, a, it's a pretty common trope for this is. kind of stuff. It is, but at the same time... It's really cool. It's, this not, is, yeah. it's, so this is just happening 30 years before, basically. Right. Um, others tell myths about the ancient city of wonders that is said to lie underneath the White Mounds. Uh, whatever the cause, citizens are being taken from their homes, killed or kidnapped by the mists, or whatever causes the mists. So that's the background of this module. But this goes on. Uh, there's, a, there's a map location for it. Hmm. But this goes on. There's even some artwork. But there's cutaway views of the dungeon levels. Mm -hmm. There are hand-drawn maps of the area around the dungeon, mm -hmm. and then it goes on and on. And uh, just the amount of detail he puts into these hand-drawn maps is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, you can see that this is a this is quite a module. But yeah, I'm printing this it's off, big, and you guys yeah. are going to go through it Good because, Lord. and I know that none of you in the party could cheat and read up on this because I'm the only one that I know of, aside from Eric, who has a copy of this. Unless it's on the Google Drive, then I'll find it. Dang it! Oh, that's true. So close. Not that he would do that. No, he, that's, never. he doesn't do that. No, that would ruin the experience. So anyway, really fantastic module here that takes up, I would say, probably a third of this of this magazine. But let's get through the module. I wish I could just slap this out there for you guys to enjoy, but I cannot. Um, what else do I want to talk about here? There are some characters that you can play to go into this. Then we move to, so anyway, great module in here. That takes us to page, what was it, 100 and 100. And then we have some book okay. reviews. Uh, these include... Three and a half stars for Patricia McKillop, The Throne of the Errol of Cheryl, with the Herring of the Dragon of Horse Breath, illustrated by Judith Mitchell. Never heard of that. I have, I have no idea what that could be. Oh, oh, it's just, okay, reviewed by Rob Washburn. Yeah. Um, there's the Dorwath Trilogy, The Time of Dark, um, Delray Books, Ballantyne, reviewed by Rob. So not only is he writing this magazine, he's also reading all kinds of fantasy books none of these though do i recognize so we're going to mm -hmm. skip on past them yeah gaming news we're back to our friend eric who supplied us with all this information and more and sorry eric but i'm going to give your gamer profile give your gamer profile uh when eric was involved in all this he was a sophomore at shelbyville high school and has been playing fantasy role-playing games for three years go eric he is a dm and has dm'd at two bat cons he's currently running an adventure for a party of first level adventurers and developing the history of the kingdom of dwarnor in the world of manset he is also a member of the role players gamers association role play role playing gamers association uh, aside from D&D, &D, Eric dabbles in Traveler, Star Frontiers, which I just bought. I was going to say, tell the people about your purchase. I just found an almost pristine copy on eBay of Star Frontiers, and it is on the way as we speak. It includes the original dice and crayon. For those of you who know, you know what that, how cool that is. Which I'm, I'm very excited for that to arrive, because we've been branching out from Dungeons & Dragons to some yep. other role-playing games, so this will be the next one on our list. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah, we'll have to see. But it's, I'm looking forward to getting yeah, being be here. Fun. When it gets here, we will probably do a regular video about it. Yeah. Um, anyway, he dabbles in Traveler, Star Frontiers, and Dragon Quest. He is an avid reader of Conan books, which I was as well. Uh, Eric enjoys music and collects old record albums, especially those of his favorite group, The Who. Well done, Eric. The Who. Um, he owns a TI computer and likes computer programming. He's thinking about studying business and computer science when he goes to college. So that's that's Eric, the man who contacted us, who was a franchise holder, who sent us all of this information. Um, World of Manset update. 
The following area franchises have been awarded to gamers interested in participating in the development of the world of Manset. So Fangdeep went to Scott Moore and Troy Ilderton. Clearwood went to Scott Lindwald and Danny Boltman of Batesville. Elevore went to Kevin McGee. So the list goes on and on. And there are actually a fair a number of people who have said, yeah, I would love to be a part of the development yeah. of, this, of this whole process. Uh, it finishes off, if you're interested in helping with the development of this campaign world and would like an area franchise, contact Rob at Role Players Workshop. Yeah, I mean, it's not an insignificant number of people. But it's I mean, really not. a lot who want to get involved in this. There's a whole page full of people who wanted to be a part of this project. Um, then, we, oh, no. then we get into Laughing Dragon Stupid Jokes, and I've got to read a couple of these. Um, don't look. Okay. What could you put into a pouch filled with 1,000 gold pieces to make it lighter? It isn't magic, but it works just as well. What? A slit. Um, which is the furriest side of a giant lynx? Which side? The outside. <laughs> Good lord. Yeah. Okay, you'll love this one because this is one of your favorite monsters. All right. What did the lurker above say to the unwary dungeon adventurers? Look out below. Close. Hands up. I've got you covered. <laughs> anyway. Oh, um, those so, are just too good. So, wow. And then there are also riddles. <laughs> we have... We have uh, Ooh, all right. Give me a riddle. Oh, you want a riddle? Yeah. yeah. This is... You know, Mushy the Great is now the Riddle Master. Oh, I love for that. Those, for those of you who watched <laughs> the previous video, um, we had Mushy the Great appear on our video. It's a mushroom. Uh, it's a little face. A little face on it. And hands. Ex expressive hands. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Answers to the riddles... What has 98 legs but can't walk? <laughs> 98 legs but can't, can't walk. walk. This is a huge table. 49 pairs of pants. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a riddle. That's just another stupid joke. Yeah, yeah, I know. This, I think that they got a little bit mixed up on yeah, some yeah. May, Or maybe <laughs> I got mixed up in... Let's see. Let's see if we can find the actual rid riddle. Okay, here I'm we gonna, go. Here we go. That one. Okay. I didn't. I couldn't distinguish between a riddle and a joke. Um, let's see. Though small and simple I may be, a bleeding death may follow me. If I have need, I fly through air, so those who fight me must beware. A tooth have I, but not a bite. Avoid my sting when in a fight. When I am large, I change my name, but still my purpose is the same. My fang drips venom when I strike, with help of killer or the like. Helpful magic may surround me, but few are those who thus have found me. What am I? That's tough. I don't know. But it's good. I, I actually like this. This is by Mark Stock. Well, what's the answer to it? I'm not sure. A dagger. Um, Though small and simple I may be, a bleeding death may follow me. If I have need, I fly through air. So those who fight me must beware. A tooth have I, but not a bite. Avoid my sting when in a fight. When I am large, I change my name. Okay. Uh, but still my purpose is the same. My fang drips venom when I strike with help of killer or the like. So if it's used yeah, by yeah, an yeah. assassin. You're, you're poisoned, yeah. Um, helpful magic may surround me, but few are those who thus have found me. What am I? I like it. That's very good. I'm going to do one more. All right, let's do it. Uh, let's see. Hang on. Let me, let me figure this out. Pause before we say the answer, and if you get the, if you think you know what it is, comment down below. Yeah, and you can even cheat, and we won't. Well, we won't have any idea. We'll just say good job and heart your comment. Exactly. Well done. It, okay, I'm going to do these next two. If you're digging in dung, watch out for this pest. If it digs in fresh flesh, it will there make its nest. Burn it out quickly. Cure disease on yourself. Only thus may you live and find your full health. What is it? This one is pretty easy. Like a like a leech. Not rock grub. No. Rock grub. Rock grub. One of, rock, 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 rock. One of my favorite uh, creatures. I should have paused and let the people figure it out, shouldn't I? You just had to pause quick. Okay, let's do... We'll, move, we'll go to this last one here. All right. Tongue of flame speaks silky lies. Mm -hmm. Golden bed under watchful eyes. Mm -hmm. Deep in wilderness, deep in cave. Greedy and cruel, rogue and knave. What am I? Oh, why can't I think of the name? I know what it is. 
I don't think it's, I don't think it's what you think it is. Is it not? Go ahead. Um, I want to say a dryad. Is that not right? No, it's a dragon. Red dragon. Oh, I suck at this. T wow. <laughs> Tongue of, oh, for three. Tongue of Flame speaks silky lies. Golden bed. Golden knife. Golden. Under watchful eyes. Yeah. Deep in wilderness, deep in cave, greedy and cruel, rogue and knave. That's yeah. pretty that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Anyway. Golden um, really killed me. That's true. Yep. yep. I'm toast. So, um, then there's just a little more um, fun, hey, let's let's follow up an amusing trip by some players through a dungeon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, won't get into that. I will. I would like to point out quickly. We are at about forty-five minutes, and I am almost here done. So sorry not to be a killjoy, but he's a killjoy. We do have another podcast because he knows. The problem is, he knows I'll go on with this for an hour and a half. And, yeah, and, and, that's why I'm here. So. That's why I'm the chief operating officer. Uh, coming in. Okay, last thing that mm -hmm. we will talk about. All right. Coming in future issues. The Beastmaster Part Three by Troy Ilderton. The Saboric Church and Dragon Silver. The Voltan the Voltanican Warrior and a Journey to Voltanica AD and D Quiz Gosset Tavern Tales Dual Personalities The Avenger Character Class mm. The Mud Dragon The Valley of Doom and Vapor Stones and Castle Avenal. So those are all different um, articles that are supposed to appear in the next issue, which I want to read. Yeah, absolutely. And it finishes off with a an overall World of Manset map where Rob has taken all of the the uh, closer scale maps mm -hmm. and made them into one overall map. So there you go. Again, thanks to Eric Johnson for getting us we appreciate it, Eric. this information. Um, he took a, he actually went out of his way to get this done. He, yeah. he did a lot of work to try and contact us. So everybody thank Eric down in the comments. Say thank you, Eric. If you could, that'd be that'd be really cool. And we're hoping I I would like we don't have the, the issue we have is that we don't have a real good grasp of the technology. Uh, but we would like to actually have a, an interview with Eric at some point if we can ever figure out how to do it. So that may be something we do in the future. Yeah, we tried it once and it didn't go it did too not. well. <laughs> so we're gonna we're, we're 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 looking at branching into things like that. Yeah, um, but we but some other stuff as well. But it also you know there's a lot of stuff we have to get to do it right, and you know we could nickel and dime, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to do it right. So yeah, um, hopefully we'll figure in the out. next couple months we'll we'll figure something like that out. Yeah. Anyway, if you have any questions about Fantasy World Magazine number two, please contact. And I'm sorry if you didn't find Fantasy World Magazine interesting but and you would have rather heard us do other things. We felt that this needed to be talked about. And if you didn't like it, well, then you're probably not here anymore. So for those of you who That's are a very good point. Hi. Yeah. Congratulations. And thanks, thanks for hanging out. the end of podcast number 11. Exactly. That's all I've got nope. for our Fantasy World Magazine. Any comments, final thoughts? I quite like it. I wish that there were more things out there today that are like this because... And, well, and there may be. There may be. But we just don't know what they are. Yeah. And within the world of Dungeons and Dragons today, without getting into too many specifics, it seems that there is not as much emphasis on um, writing and creativity and trying to... Well, I think the community aspect is not there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's... it's I, I think it is, but it's it's different. So I just like this, you know, coming together to create something as a group that everyone can be proud of at the same time. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And I wish that there were more opportunities for things like that to happen. Exactly. In exactly. the modern world. So, Rob, well done. Please get a hold of us if you're out there somewhere with internet access and interest in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons right. YouTube videos that are from a family channel. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but as you mentioned, time is up, and we need to be getting our Patreon podcast done. Yeah. Yes, so, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. So let's get moving on to that. But thanks for tuning in, guys. If you have any questions, let us know, and we will try and get back to you. We sure will. But, Check out the links below and on our website and all that good stuff. Yep. You know where to look. You know That's where it is. Yeah, you've been here before. Smash like. Subscribe. The whole thing. I'm Jim. I'm Alex. Keep your store going free. Hasta la vista. Baby.